introduce our next speaker, Aubrey Sambor. Am I saying yep. that right? Yep, got it. Fantastic. Aubrey, where are you from? I am from Western Massachusetts. Wahoo! Yep. Western Massachusetts. Aubrey is a talented web developer with a keen eye for design and a deep understanding of CSS. Today she will be presenting color in CSS using new spaces, functions, and techniques to make your site shine. Uh, that's almost a tongue twister for me. <laughs> in, in this session, Aubrey will explore the latest advancements in CSS color management and show us how to enhance our website with vibrant and effective color management. Wow. As a <laughs> photographer, I love this. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. All right. Looks like it's 11, so I'm going to get started. Um, my session is already introduced, but again, uh, welcome to Color in CSS, using new spaces, functions, and techniques to make your site shine. Um, a little bit more about me, again, my name is Aubrey Sambor. I am a lead engineer at Lullabot, but I focus on front-end development. Um, I live in Western Massachusetts, and I have been doing CSS since the late 90s. Um, I learned CSS initially because I wanted to, and I wouldn't do this now, I wanted to remove those underlines from my links and I didn't really look because I thought they looked ugly when I was like <laughs> 17 and playing with my like website way back in the day. But now you want to have those underlines. You don't really want to get rid of those. Um, you can find me online in a few different places. I am the most active on Mastodon. So if you're on Mastodon, you can follow me at labyrinth.social slash starshaped. I've got a blog at starshaped.org. You can follow me on LinkedIn. And of course, I have a Drupal.org profile. My username is Starshaped pretty much everywhere else. If you're on X, I do have an account there, but I haven't updated it in about two years, but you can follow it if you want to. All right, so what am I gonna talk about today? First, I'm gonna give an overview of current color spaces that are available today. I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's new in the CSS color modules level four and five. I'm going to talk about some new CSS color functions and how to use them. I'm going to go over a way to use custom CSS custom properties or CSS variables to change values of color items, but there is a better way to do this now, so I'm going to really talk about that. And then there are a couple of kind of new bleeding edge things that will help make your site more accessible color-wise, um, the light dark function and a really new and experimental function called color contrast that really isn't available anywhere, anywhere yet but it would be really cool once it actually gets in. All right, first I'm gonna talk about current color spaces that are available today, but before I get into those, I'm gonna do a really quick overview about what a gamut is. I'm not gonna go into much detail about this, but it's important due to what you're viewing, like what kind of devices you're viewing things on and things like that. So a gamut is a range of colors that are supported on a device it's usually displayed as shapes within a, something called the human visual gamut. And I've got a, like a visualization of this on the next slide. But it's a range of colors. That's the most important part about what a gamut is. And there's a couple different examples of gamuts. The one that you're most familiar with when you work on the web is sRGB, because that's the one that had been supported for the longest time. If you had like a really old CRT monitors and things like that, that's the gamut that those support. And there's a newer one called P3 that a lot of Apple devices support. I think most modern Apple devices support it. I'm pretty sure like a lot of new monitors and things like this also support it. So this should have that support as well. And it's also called wide gamut, if you've heard that term. It just means it's millions, it's millions of more colors than what RGB, um, RGB supports. So it's kind of the more modern, P3 is the more modern, more new, like the newer gamuts that you'll see in a lot of newer devices. And here is a picture, uh, let's see, sometimes this picture takes a little bit of time to show up. Hopefully it shows up soon. I don't know why I've run into this every time. Everywhere. <laughs> yeah, every time I've given this talk, like it takes forever for this image to show up. So this is a view of the human visual gamut. This like kind of curvy space thingy is what the human visual gamut is. And it's a view of all colors visible by the human eye. And you can kind of see this little, there's like a little triangle that's outlined right here. That is a representation of the sRGB gamut. So that is the range of colors that you see like on your old CRT monitors and things like that. So that means that you don't see all colors on your, um, 
on your old like CRT monitors and things like that. There's way more colors that just aren't supported by that gamut. And there's also different color spaces that are all within the human visual gamut, and they all have different triangles and things like that. So I don't have representations of those, but like some of the other ones would have different triangle shapes depending on how many more colors they support and things like that. But just wanted to give you a visualization of how many colors are actually available versus what we can actually see with some of the um, color spaces that we're gonna be working with. And going into color spaces, that second image will hopefully clear up. Again, must be the internet here. Um, it's an arrangement of colors within a particular gamut. And these are two examples of um, some of the color spaces. So the first one on the top is the RGB color space. It's usually represented as a cube with red, green, and blue representing the different sides of the cube. And then the one right below it is the HSL color space. And that's usually represented as a cylinder because the hue goes all the way around the color wheel. So it's like from, goes from zero to 360 degrees. And then the saturation goes from the, the uh, center outward and the lightness is top and bottom. So it's just represented that way so you can kind of visualize what the color space actually means. So to summarize, a gamut is a collection of colors and the color space is how those colors are arranged within that gamut. So now I'll go into the current color spaces that we have right now. And I'm gonna talk, I think I'm gonna talk about three different color spaces that we have. The first one is gonna be the one you're most familiar with and the one you've probably been working with for, for a long time if you've been working with color. And that's the RGB color space. And this is the only color space you could use up until CSS Color Module 4 came out. So anything you were doing having to do with color on the, on the web was in RGB. And so if you've used hex values, if you've used name colors in your CSS, or if you've used RGB or HSL in your, um, in your CSS color definitions, all of those are RGB. And then there's a new HWB function, but I'll talk about that one a little bit more once I start talking more about the color module four and what was new in there. So I'll briefly go through some of these other color spaces, or color, um, like color space uh, functions in here. This first one is hex, and you've probably used this if you've done any sort of color definition on the web. It's the hexadecimal values where you go from zero to F, and I just have an example of how you define one, like a fun hot pink. And um, they can also do shorthand with some of them if you're defining like black or white. Instead of doing all six zeros, you can just do the three. So just quick overview of hex. The next one is named colors. This one makes it a little bit easier. It's just predefined keywords that are based off of the hex colors. And this also includes current color and transparent. So instead of actually writing out the hex value, you can just write the color name. Not every single hex value has a named color, but a lot of the really popular ones do. So if you want to use those, you can use those instead. Uh, next up, I'm going to go through a couple of these functions that are in the RGB color space. And the most common one is the RGB function. It mixes R red, green, and blue to make the different colors. And again, here's that picture of that cube that I showed on my first slide. And up until color module four, there was only one way you can write these functions. It's the RGB, zero, like the red value, comma, green value, comma, blue value. And those three values are again, red, green, and blue. They all range from zero to 255. And if you wanted to have any opacity on this, you have to use RGBA. And then you have a percentage at the end to make that like you can, uh, you can adjust the opacity using that. The next one after this is again HSL. I mentioned this one earlier too. And this one arranges colors in that RGB space in a different way, as I was saying before, where it's the hue is all the way around in the color wheel. It goes from zero to 360 degrees. And then the saturation and the lightness are both percentage, percentages of like how saturated or desaturated you want your color to be and how light and dark you want the color to be. And it's similar to RGB, you can do HSLA for the opacity with the last value being a percentage of 
how, how opaque you want, or how much opacity you want to add to your color space there, or to your definition there. <clears throat> and so those were what you had up until CSS Color Module Level 4. And now I'm going to talk about some of the new things that are in Color Module Level 4. I think this came out, I don't know how long this has been out now, but it's been around for a little bit now, like maybe the last four or five years. Don't count, like, don't quote me on that. I'll have to double check and see how long it's been around. But it is, a lot of these are supported in all modern browsers now, so you can use them now. You can use them today. So, so what's new in Module 4 is, the biggest one is the support for the color spaces other than RGB. And a couple examples of those are the CIE color space, display P3 color space, and there's a couple other ones that, again, they're different shapes within that human visual gamut that I showed earlier. There are a couple new color functions. I, I touched on HWB, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about all these in a little bit. And then there's also lab and OK lab, LCH and OK LCH, and then there's also a generic color, mod, uh, color function that you can use to define colors in other color spaces. And there's also a syntax update for color definitions. I was saying before that um, to define RGB or HSL, you had to have commas in between all of your uh, channel values, but now you don't need them. And now you don't need a separate function for RGBA. You can just add the opacity at the end. So just kind of simplifying the definition a little bit so that it's easier to write um, these functions. And then there was one new named color, Rebecca Purple, that came in um, during module level four, which is named after Eric Meyer's uh, daughter who sadly passed away from brain cancer. Her name is Rebecca. He was a very early pioneer of CSS. So they wanted to kind of honor her in a way, so they gave her a named color. It's pretty purple too. <clears throat> so here is one of the new functions that is in CSS color module four. HWB, and that is hue, whiteness, and blackness. And it's another RGB color space, way to access the RGB color space. It's a lot like HSL, where the H is also hue, and that also goes around the color wheel from zero to 360. You can kind of see that representation a lot better here. And then whiteness and blackness, within that triangle, you can like move your, that, that little circle closer to the white or to the black to kind of change the color definition there. So you have that range of color within the RGB space to do that. And then this is also using that new syntax where there's no commas between the items in the definition. And you define it by a degree and two percentages, again, a lot like HSL. So this is a new one. I haven't seen it used very much, but it is another option in case you do want to use something that's not RGB or HSL. So it's just another uh, tool you can use. And one other, one other function that's really RGB specific is this color function because they had kept on creating different functions for RGB, HSL, HWB. Now they just wanted to do a generic one so you can just pass up any parameters you want to it. So this one, you pass the name of the color space you want to use. So in my example, you're using display P3 as your color space and then you have to do a red, green, and blue channel and the, you know, the yellow, the 0 0.5.85 is how you define that. And I have a code pen to show you what this looks like and what it looks like when you're actually doing a definition in a different color space outside of RGB. Like what it looks like in Safari to show you what the color picker looks like. So let me get my Safari up and running here. So this is an example I have with two different squares one using the P3 color, one using the P3 color space, and I can probably show this. See if I can make this bigger. Um, and so the two definitions are right here. I have two. One's the color function that is just doing the display P3, and the other one is doing the sRGB. And hopefully you can see what I'm going to try showing here in Safari. I'm going to inspect this element, and you can see I've got the background color. And you can click on this to pop up this color, this uh, color picker here. And what you can see in here, I'm trying to, I can't make this any bigger, sadly, but there's like a little line that goes across the top and down. And anything to the left of that is the sRGB color space. 
But what you can see in this example up here is the little dot that's showing me what color is using is outside of that color space. So this means that this display P3 definition I'm using is using a color that is not within the sRGB color space. So that's what's really cool about using this color function to actually get outside of what you used to be able to um, you used to be able to access. And so this P3 is a lot brighter. And it dep again, you can only see this if you're on monitors that support this P3 um, gamut. And this one does. And if you have like a newer Mac or, any, or a newer Windows machine, you should also be able to see all of this too. So I just wanted to show you how this is outside of that color space. And it's pretty neat. Go back to the presentation. <clears throat> so those, that is pretty much it with RGB color space and showing what the display P3 color space looks like outside of that RGB. So this new one I'm talking about now is the CIE color space. And this one is different than RGB because it was modeled after how colors are perceived by the human eye. And it's something called a perpetually uniform space, which means like when you're defining like HSL or something <coughs> like that, the lightness doesn't look uniform across colors. So I have this example of a code pen and I have a yellow and a blue. <coughs> and the brightness is kind of different. Like they seem, you can't really see it very well here, but the yellow looks way, way brighter than the blue does. So it's kind of jarring to see, even though they have the same saturation and lightness defined down here. They both have 100% saturation and 50% lightness. The, they, look, they don't look the same. One of them is kind of like pulling your eyes away because they're not very perpetually uniform. Um, but the CIE color space, lightness will be uniform across all colors, so it looks a little bit better when you're actually looking at two colors side by side. And there are two different spaces within the CIE color space that I'll talk about. And the first one is lab, and this one is lightness, and then there are two color channels, A and B, which don't stand for anything, but they're both ranges. The A is a range from red to green, and the B is a range from blue to yellow. And the way you define these is you do lab, and then the first number is the lightness, and then there's a negative, a negative 66, negative 30. So the second param parameter, when it's above zero, it makes it more red, and below zero it makes it more green. So this would be like a greener, this would be a greener definition. And then the third parameter is above zero is yellow, below zero is more blue. So this one again is a more blue. So it would kind of make like a blue-green kind of color if I had an example of this. And then you can do an optional opacity like you can with the new syntax. So this is a little confusing, like trying to remember A and B, trying to remember what's going to make it more yellow, what's going to make it more green. So within this color space, we have LCH as, as well. So this one is lightness, chroma, and hue, which makes a little more sense than A and B. And lightness is the same, range from zero to 100%. The chroma kind of differs depending on what gamut you're in. Um, it's kind of like a saturation. I think that's the best way to define what a chroma is. And it can be between zero and 0.5, but again, depending on what you have your, uh, what gamut you're in and whether, what hue you have, this could change. And I've got like an example of what a color picker in LCH looks like in a little bit, but there's a lot of like variation and, and adjustments with some of these color spaces because of the way that they're perpetually uniform and how they mimic the human visual uh, gamut. So you define it kind of similarly to like L uh, LA, like to lab where you do have the percentage, you do the gamut of like the 0.5, and then the hue is the same as like HSL, where you do the zero to 360. So that is lab and LCH. And they're fine, but there are some issues with it. So there's a new color space that was made maybe five years ago or something like that called the OK Lab color space. And this one, it's the same as the CIE, but there was some, some a person who was really good at math came in and made some color corrections using like some functions and things like that. And he wrote this blog post about this and you can scroll through it. You can see that there's some like division and 
so, some cosines and tangents and things like that to kind of fix up how some of these colors have been rendering with some of the in these color spaces. So, yeah. So this is, so the issue you're having here is, um, yeah, the lightness isn't uniform across colors. Like I was saying earlier, I showed all that. Um, and so there are two different color spaces within OK Lab. First one is OK Lab. It's pretty much the same as Lab, but if there's some color corrections that were made in here. The gradients are more consistent than the regular lab due to the math that this person created. Um, there's a lot of issues in the lab example or in lab that when you're going from, say, a blue to white um, range in lab, it would kind of go through the purple space first, and then the math corrections actually fix that. So now you actually see that it goes from white to blue. And I've got an example of this where you can see lab gradient here. What's, what I have defined here is um, a color mix that's supposed to go from, where is it? It's supposed to go from blue to white. So I have it defined to be start your linear gradient, start it at blue, and make it go over to white. And that's it. Only two colors that I have defined in here. You can see the lab gradient, instead of going from blue to white, it's kind of starting off with some blue, but then going into purple, and then going to the white, which I don't really want. I want it from blue to white. So um, the initial math within lab has these weird color issues. The co corrections in OK Lab, based on that math I showed you, fixes this, and you can see now it goes from the blue to the white, and that is what you want. So the OK Lab, again, adds these um, fixes that yeah, help with the math. And then again, there's OK LCH, which makes these similar, they make the similar color corrections to fix these blue, blue hue shifts. And I'm going to see what I have in this code pen here. So this is an example of why you would use OKLCH versus an HSL, where um, it's the same kind of color definitions, but the HSL examples are bright. One of them like kind of pops out more. And if you do those same definitions in OKLCH, they're a lot more muted. They're a lot more uniform for your eyes. So this is a reason why you'd want to use these kind of things even though you might run into some weird issues with the math and stuff. Um, so that is what you, why you'd want to use that. And then there's an OKLCH color picker. And this looks like a lot of stuff that's going on on this page. Um, but you can adjust your lightness, chroma, and hue. You can drag these across. And you'll see when you drag them across, the options that you have for the lightness and the chroma change depending on what hue you're using. So there's, again, a lot of math that goes into why, like how these get calculated and things like that. So it's a more complex way to define your colors, but you have a lot more ranges of colors and a lot more ways to kind of play around with what kind of colors you want. So if you're wanting to do that kind of thing with your project, you'd want to use things like OKLCH OK just so you have cooler, brighter colors and things like that. But again, it's still it's new and it's supported in all browsers, but it's still not widely adopted yet. All right, so that's it for color module four. Now we're gonna talk about module level five, and there's not as much color theory complication stuff in here. This is a lot more new cool functions you can use in your CSS to kind of adjust your color. So I'm gonna talk about a couple different things. I'm gonna talk about color mix, which I've showed you a little bit of. Um, I'm gonna show you relative color syntax, which as of like three days ago is now supported in all browsers, so I had to actually look that up. Um, and update my slides because Firefox was not, didn't support it up until like, Tuesday, so <laughs> <laughs> that was nice to like, hear about. And then there's the light dark function, which again is now supported in all browsers, which it wasn't three months ago the last time I gave this talk, so had to do some updates there too. And these are all pretty cool to use. All right, first up, color mix. So this is a way to mix colors using CSS without having to use like a mix function in SAS or updating your custom properties in HSL. And the way you do this is you just do color mix. You define what color space you want to use. So my first example is using our sRGB. And I'm mixing blue and white, so I want a lighter blue. You can use color mixes in different color spaces. I have another example using OKLCH. But there are some weird issues using color mix in OKLCH, which is another reason why 
I don't know how often I would actually use OKLCH right now, but there is a weird issue with this. I'll show you this, this GitHub example because it's easier for me to show this as opposed to popping it up in all the browsers. So when you're mixing OKLCH, white and blue, this is what happens in all the different browsers. So a color mix white and blue in Chrome, it's pink. OK, uh, OKLCH color mix in Safari is green. And in Firefox, it is this blue, but it's not the same blue that it should be, which is this one that's slightly darker. So there's some problems with color mix in the OKLCH space. If you were going to use color mix, it's probably better to use, like, to stay within the RGB space to do it, because it works, and you'll have more consistent results. If not, you'll run into this kind of issue where these, this is a wide range of differences, and hopefully, I mean, this issue is closed, but it seems like it's still a problem, so I actually popped it open in all different browsers, and I'm still seeing issues. But here is an example of color mix. Um, I have two examples. This top one is the default color I define is this kind of darker pink, and I'm using HSL to make it lighter. My second example is the default color in RGB, and I'm using color mix to make it lighter. So there's a slight difference in how you do that. And then my CSS down here, um, I have the def definition of the background color here for the light pink. So it's an RGB, you know, 191.64.106. And then to make it lighter, I mix that RGB definition with white and with making it 50% lighter with the 50% that I have defined here. So that way you're able to like mix your colors. Usually I like mixing white and black to kind of either make the color lighter or darker. So that's what I'm doing here in this example to just make it lighter. And next up is relative color syntax, but before I get into that, I'm going to talk about the older way of doing things, and that is, oops, is updating colors using custom properties. And this is how you would do it before relative color syntax was supported everywhere. So if you wanted to create a variant of a color, you would usually have to create a custom property for each part. Like if it's HSL, creating a custom property for your hue, your saturation, and your lightness. And if you wanted to update, say, the lightness, you have to manipulate that to and then reassemble it so that you have that color that's lighter. So I have an example of this too, which is similar. Like you could use color mix for this too, but this is just an example of how you did it before color mix was also um, supported everywhere. So I'm defining the HSL for the color on the left. It's kind of burgundy color. <coughs> Define it the hue, saturation, and lightness, but now I want to make it lighter. You know, so I'm going to make the new lightness be 75% instead of 25%. And I'll create a new custom property for this lighter color using this new lightness variable. So that's what I did here to make these two different color, these two different boxes, that one with the lighter color. It was good to be able to have the separate parts to be able to ma manipulate them how you want. But there is an easier way to do it now with relative color syntax. Which again now, when I first did these slides, it was only supported in Chrome and Safari, but Firefox 128 came out like, yeah, earlier this week, and with it came support for relative color syntax. So this makes it easier to manip manipulate your colors without having to pull them all apart. And so my examples here are using HSL. So my first relative, the first relative syntax example I have is saying, hey, I want to have, I want to make this be green, and here are the three different HSL parts. So this is going to make that, that's going to make the background color of the square green. But I want to, but what if I want to shift the hue of this, the H in the HSL? And I don't want to have to create all the different custom properties for the H, S, and L. So now with relative color syntax, you can use the calc function down there and add, since hue is degree based, you can add 200 degrees and it'll shift it around the color wheel to make it a different hue. So I have an example of this as well. And now it'll actually work in Firefox because Firefox supports this. And you can see my two examples here. The first one, scroll all the way down here, um, is this relative syntax that's green. The same example I had before saying, <coughs> make this green. And down here, the hue shift one that's purple is adding 200 degrees to the color wheel. And since green's hue is 120, it goes all the way around to 320, which makes it this purple instead. 
And you can do this similarly with the saturation and the lightness. Like if, you, if say you wanted to make this a lighter percentage, you can update that in there. But the hue one was cool because you can do the calculation and things in there. And keeping it like on the wheel, like you probably do some sort of color math to make sure that it's like, um, so you can make sure it's like proportional color wise and things like that on the color wheel. So there's cool things you can do with it. And now you don't have to separate out everything into different custom properties and you can do this kind of math there. <clears throat> and then there are a, color, a couple of color functions that can help out with accessibility. And these have also been really nice to have. Or one of them in particular has been nice to have now that it's in all browsers. And that one is light dark. Again, this used to only be supported in Firefox, but now Chrome and Safari also support it. And this is a better way to add styles depending on, uh, between light and dark mode, um, instead of having to define them using like a root and defining new like variables for each one. You can just define this color scheme in your root, and then you define the color as light dark. And the first example in here, the 333 is, light, is what the text color would be in light mode. And then the CCC would be the text color when you're in dark mode. I have an example of this. I'll have to open up my settings. Let's see here. Don't have it open. So I'll fire up my system settings here. And you can see I've got two examples. I have the prefers color scheme and I have the light dark. Prefers color scheme is how you used to have to do it, um, to go between light and dark mode. But now with light dark, you don't need to do all of that work. And you can see that it works if I go to dark mode. Both of them go to dark mode like, you're, like you expect, because I had the light dark definition down in here. Where I've got the background color and the text color defined, I have the color scheme light dark, I have the light dark background color and light dark text color variables using that new light dark, light dark function. And then I have the old method of, oh, I've got, a def I've got to do a media prefers color scheme to do it. But having the light dark is a little bit easier. So now that that's, that's the way to do that. And this last thing I'm going to show is color contrast. This one is experimental. It's only supported behind a flag in Safari. It's part of a newer CSS module level six, which is not even close to being approved or anything like that. I actually think this color contrast function is called contrast color now, but I don't think browsers e even have that in their, def in their like, uh, flags or anything yet. So color contrast is still the way that it's defined in, um, in the one browser that supports it, which is Safari with the flag. And this text color will change, or whatever you have defined will change depending on what has the most contrast within the background color. Um, there, it currently uses the WCAG 2.1 algorithm, but it might change, and who knows what, what the most contrast means, so I think there's some work that still needs to be done there. But you define it this way, um, you color dash contrast, you define the two different colors on this background, and depending on what the background color is, the color will change. And I've got a code pen that Dave Rupert made, I did not write this, but you can see how this works over here. So this is a definition that, again, Dave Rupert made this, and has a light background with hello world on it. One of the things is a link and one of them is text. And this will only work here, but if I move this lightness to be darker, I'm making the background darker, you'll see at this point, the contrast changed enough, so now the, the link is green. If I make it even darker, the text changes to white. So this would be a cool thing once it gets implemented, but again, it's nowhere near being ready yet because it's within a color module definition that's not even, like I would assume the CSS working group is talking about it, but it hasn't been approved or anything yet. So wrapping up, there are lots of new things happening with color. There are new color spaces such as HWB, lab, OKLCH, new functions like color and color mix, and I needed to update this slide. I can take out this Firefox needs to support it because it does now. And then there are functions to help with accessibility such as light, dark, and color contrast. 
if you are wanting to read more, there's all these um, articles about colors and new definitions and things like that, if you want to know more. The slides should already be up on the page that my, um, my, my uh, session page on Drupal Asheville has all the slides, so you're able to look at them there. And yeah, again, here's my information again. If you wanted to reach out to me on Mastodon or add me on LinkedIn or find me on Drupal.org, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, that's it. Ta da! <laughs> it looks like I've got about 10 minutes for questions if anybody has any questions. We're in Asheville, North Carolina, and Asheville likes to consider itself kind of creative. So, given the topic of color, what comments do you have on color that you have associated with Asheville? Any questions or comments on that? Aubrey, you're from Massachusetts. Is this your first time in, in Asheville? No, it's my second time here. Not, not to this camp, but my first time at this camp, but second time to Asheville. All yeah. right. And, and on the topic of Asheville, creativity, and color, any comments or thoughts? <laughs> There's a lot of it. Yeah, There's also, a lot of it. OK. Uh, River Arts District? Right? Yeah, I was say all the pot I went, I went there last time I was in Asheville to the River Arts District and lo loved all the pottery and colors there. Nice, that was nice. nice. So I have to know when you go to your hair stylist and ask for a color. Yeah. <laughs> do I tell them no OKLCH? Okay, what, what's the dialogue that you have? I'll say OKLCH. Okay, no, I'm kidding. I uh, know <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's nice and bright. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. All right. Well, I, again, Nashville is a creative community. I, I've been here since 1978. So I'm very proud of it and I'm super happy that uh, individuals like Aubrey talk about this an incredible topic here at UNCA. Any other comments or questions? This is uh, pretty darn impressive in my opinion. Oh, thank you. I'm a photographer, so. Oh, yeah, you're all about it, yeah. I, I need to be more about it. That. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this, this is a topic that I think is uh, what defines uh, the good and the best. Anybody here uh, have a comment on color that they want to associate while we have a minute or two? Any other photographers? No photographers? I'm a painter. You're a painter, okay. Well, that's and interesting to me too, the way uh, color models work with light versus pigments. Very different. Mm. Uh, are you from the Asheville area? Or? I'm from Raleigh. From Raleigh? And I ask these questions because I work for workforce development and you know just how cool that we can bring into Asheville, North Carolina this diversity and this kind of specialized topic. Um, I'm an old black and white photographer, so uh, fixer black, uh, uh, developer of black uh, stop bath fixer type things. What inspired you, Aubrey, to go into this field? What, what was your, your passion about this? this is about about this uh, about the color stuff in general. Or? Yes, absolutely. Oh, so um, yeah. The question was, what got me into wanting to do a talk about color, and it was because I didn't really know a lot about the new color spaces and wanted to learn more and see if I could actually use them on my current projects. I haven't been able to use them on my current projects yet, but it's cool that there are the different HSLs and um, HWBs, like those kind of new functions you can use. If I ever make a web, if I ever was to work on a website with a lot of high definition images and things like that, like a photography website, um, then I maybe want to use that display P3 color function a lot so that people could actually see the vibrant colors and things like that. So it was like a learning experience, wanting to see what kind of examples and things that you can actually do with the new color spaces. Also, it seemed very confusing to me when I was first looking at it, being like, what is a gamut? What is like? What's the difference between all these color spaces? And so, yeah, pretty much wanted to learn it and then show and share it to other people so that other people also know about what other color options are out there. Do you have a unique monitor that you're using to make sure that you're getting the color hues and gamuts that you're expecting that are true colors? It's a black. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the question was do I use a special monitor? And I mean I do have like a big four K monitor at home, but it's the same kind of color space that like it it has the P three wide gamut, like pretty much any monitor or any computer you have now um, will also have. Which is why you were able to see in my example you could see the P three colors and if you look at my my slides on your computer you would also be able to see that too. 
when it comes to nature and color, and we all associate fall and definitely Asheville, North Carolina, Western North Carolina is about the, the color schemes. Any thoughts or comments on that? What's what color schemes of like the fall? Or? Uh, yeah, or the, you know, again, I'm not as knowledgeable as the group here, but I do represent Western North Carolina, mm -hmm. and uh, eager to have uh, comments and dialogues to share with the community. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not sure of the question. Like you're talking about, like what kind of colors? So interesting here in Western North Carolina, uh, Hunger Games was fil filmed in uh, State Park that used to be an industrial site where there would, um, the, the company made color products. Mm -hmm. Anybody familiar with this? Um, if you're new to Western North Carolina and have the time to drive about an hour west, uh, DuPont Forest mm -hmm. is relatively new. It's about a, a decade old, but before it, it was an industrial site and they did color color stuff. Oh, cool. Um, but they weren't good community stewards. Mm -hmm. So there still are actual sections of the state park that you cannot go into because of toxicity or whatever or whatever. But it is um, DuPont Forest. Hunger Games was filmed there as a famous star point. But to, to know that the, the history of color, the and, and industrialization of that has a history here in Western North Carolina. Sweet, that's cool. Oh yeah? Uh, just a curiosity question. So what does happen if you define for the P3 palette and somebody views it on an older monitor? Does it fall back to relatively the same colors or do the colors not render at all? Or? Yeah, so the question is um, if you're looking at a P3 color space, a 3P color definition on a monitor that's older that doesn't support it, what happens? And yeah, it'll try to fall back to what the closest RGB equivalent is. So you'll still be able to see something, it just won't be as bright. And you don't have to do like an at supports or anything like that, it'll just fall back. What are the main limitations for implementing this that you've come across? Is that just designers getting the colors in? design or you know why haven't you used this much so far uh, the question is why haven't i used more of these definitions yet and a lot of it is because of that i think a lot of designer tools like figma um they're still using a lot of rgb in their in their um in their like designs and things like that like there hasn't really been wider support for doing it in like designs and things so that's one reason i could probably like try to convert it, and I think there are some converters out there like to kind of see oh, if you want this brighter, you can do this. So there could be some of that, but yeah, I haven't because a lot of designers also haven't been doing things with P3 or using like any other, the, any other color spaces besides RGB. We have three or four minutes left here. I, I, I represent Western North Carolina workforce. So Aubrey, if you were to go to a high school, and try and get a, a, you know, the kids excited about a profession in, in web development with color sensitivity. What, what comments or thoughts would you provide to the high school community, kids stepping out to the workforce? Like with color sensitivity, like if they like, have issues with color blindness and things like that, or and in that comes general? To mind. I mean, we're, we're looking to inspire the workforce of the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, I mean, the way I got into it, and I got into this, I was like, in, in the late 90s when I was a teenager, I thought it was just really cool to build stuff on the internet where, oh, I can like make my own website and put stuff on the internet and people can see what I'm doing. And being able to kind of like control what colors you're using, control how things actually work and look, I thought that was really cool and it was able, I could actually like show it to people. So that was like why I got into web development 25 years ago. Um, and I would hope that other kids who like building things with their hands um, would also be something that they would really love. Fantastic. Y'all are a quiet group to be such a large group. I find this hard to believe here. Any creativity comments <laughs> from the group here? Wow. That was really interesting. Was Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, to see. Yeah. Thank you, Aubrey. Yeah, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, you can ask me at the after party too.